Uh, this is uh, email authentication and deliverability. It's more than just MailChimp. Uh, am I okay volume-wise for y'all in the back? Cool. Um, so I hope everyone's ready for exciting email deliverability at 4 p.m. on a Saturday. Uh, so what are we going to go over? Uh, sort of uh, get a have an idea of who all's here and um, you know who I am. Uh, we'll talk about email standard changes that have recently happened, uh, which are kind of important. Uh, and then we'll do kind of a little bit of a bit of background into how we got to where we're at, and then uh, sort of a a process to take action in your own particular organization's ecosystem, and then hopefully time for a little bit of Q and A. Uh, so, well, so basically, who's here? Uh, does anyone handle email communication at your organization? Um, is anyone responsible for a, maintaining a Drupal site that sends email? Yeah, figured that one we definitely get here. Uh, is anyone the de facto IT resource when stuff doesn't work, people come calling? Yeah, figured that might also be a thing. Uh, so I'm Steve Pashby. I'm the director of consulting at Design Hammer. Uh, I am not a developer. I'm not a sysadmin. Uh, so if you want to stump me, you'll be able to do so pretty successfully. Um, on the other hand, I uh, work at a small firm. We wear a lot of hats, so a little bit of a generalist. Um, and uh, so that's a little bit about me, so kind of what we're doing, what's changed, kind of how email's history gets us to where we're at today, uh, some common blind spots that organizations run into, uh, and then sort of how you can see what's going on with your organization and kind of a process for dealing with deliverability issues. Um, so again, not a developer assistant admin. Um, email deliverability, actually super complicated. Um, so there's definitely very likely situations we're not going to cover. Uh, but the process that we're outlining, I think, will help you a lot to find those own particular situations in your own particular IT world to actually figure them out. Um, you'll probably need to work with someone who has some technical ability to implement stuff. Uh, and you'll need to have a monitoring solution. I'll provide some recommendations of ones that are out there. I don't have a strong opinion about which one you use. Don't get any money for any of them. So email standard changes. What's changed and what does it mean? So starting in 2024, Google and Yahoo uh, instituted more stringent requirements for emails received by users of their mail services, you know, Gmail and Yahoo Mail. So Gmail. Who here has a Gmail account? Yeah, lots of folks, right? So it's not, like that's, that's a large percentage of people. So even though all this is not a like big S standard, it is a de facto situation that you have to deal with. Uh, so if you want to maximize your receipt of your emails by uh, users on Gmail and Yahoo Mail, you kind of need to follow these standards. And they're good best practices anyway. Will work across the board, but it, um, first came up with this talk based off of uh, uh, folks in the association space who are, were legit freaking out about um, why emails are ending up in spam, oh my goodness. Um, and so this is something that maybe your clients will want to know, it's good information, something you can help out uh, your own organization as well. Additionally, um, uh, DMARC implementation will be a mandatory requirement for uh, PCI compliance starting in 2025. So anyone that's doing credit cards, they actually need to kind of do this stuff too. So what changed? I'm actually going to increase the size of my presenter slide here because it is super awkward. There we go. That's good. Uh, so there are requirements for all senders and there are some requirements for bulk senders for everyone. You need to have either SPF or DKIM configured for your domain. We'll talk about what that is in a second. Um, you need to have your sending domains, IPs, have to have valid forward or reverse DNS records. Um, that's stuff that an organization probably has to deal with because that's stuff you set up in your DNS. You've got to get it done. Um, stuff that your email sending provider probably handles, but if you're doing it yourself, be aware of this. Um, you need to use a TLS connection for transmitting email. 
you need to format your email messages according to the correct protocol. Uh, and if you forward email, you need to use arc headers. Uh, and then there's good behavior requirements. Um, basically, for Gmail particularly, you need to keep um, below an average of 0.1% uh, spam rate, and your spam rate needs to never be above 0.3%. Uh, so if it goes above that, your domain is kind of in a bad shape for Gmail delivery. Um, and then don't impersonate Gmail. I don't know why they don't like it. So for bulk senders, you also need to have DMARC email authentication configured, uh, though DMARC policy of none is allowed. We'll talk about what that means in detail in a second. Um, and for direct mail, uh, your domain sender and your from header must be aligned with either your SPF domain or your DCAM domain. But that's a requirement for passing DMARC, so you know, this all kind of works together. Um, and additionally, if you're doing either a marketing message or a subscription message, there needs to be a one-click uh, unsubscribe. So that's like if, if, so, if it's something that someone has subscribed to, in every email you need to have a one-click unsubscribe in order to let them get out. So who's a bulk sender? Uh, that it's, of course, Google, it's sort of vague, but it's a, a sender that sends close to 5,000 messages or more to personal Gmail accounts within a 24-hour period. Um, and it's not an account, it's the primary domain that sent that. And uh, bulk sender status doesn't have an expiration date. So if it happens once, you're a bulk sender for perpetuity. So um, currently, uh, Google and Yahoo are allowing bulk senders with DMARC to use a policy of none. Uh, we'll talk about what that is in a second, but there's no guarantee they won't increase that to a higher level policy later. Um, so it's possible that you will want to work towards a higher level DMARC policy. Um, and additionally, some, uh, some email services will uh, trust your domains a bit more if you have a higher level email policy, so, or DMARC policy. So it's, there's some value there. So now we've got what's changed. Let's do a little bit of background and figure out what all these acronyms mean. So, talked about, uh, so I, I like, like to think about it as spam, spoofing, and phishing. So what is that? So we all know spam. It's a meat product. It comes in a can. Um, introduced in 1937. Uh, figures prominently in a Monty Python skit uh, that has a song and everything. It's pretty great. Um, but basically, email spam is unsolicited messages uh, sent in bulk via email. Uh, it was first named spam because it's something that was repetitive and annoying and people don't want. So how much spam is sent? Um, so a little bit of back in the napkin math. Um, last year, there were almost 350 billion emails sent received daily. And a bit over 45% of those were deemed as spam. So, you know, almost 160 billion spam emails are sent and received daily. So kind of huge. Uh, so if you think about it, about half of the emails sent, someone considers spam. So why is that a problem? Well, in short, because no one played on the internet. Um, basically, uh, electronic mail messages started in the 60s uh, in, you know, as ways within a mainframe to uh, send messages between users. Um, SMTP, which is kind of still used today, um, was created in the 80s based on implementations from the 70s. Um, effectively, it has naive assumptions. So it allows for man in the middle attacks. Um, and over time, we've had a variety of band-aids that have been applied. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's still a problem. So, um, Basically, all of the hoops and stuff that email has to jump through is because it's, at its core, a naive process. So here is our ideal email flow, just so we're all on the same page. We have a sending email client, you know, whatever you're using to type in your email. It goes to your email service, in this case, uh, you know, let's say Office 365, receiving email service, let's say Gmail. 
and then it comes down to a client to your recipient's email client. Message goes from point A to B to C to D, and that's how it goes through. But So this, um, you know, there's traditionally two types of spam uh, out there. One is unwanted or otherwise junk email, and the other is fraudulent email. So that's typically achieved by spoofing, and that could involve uh, phishing or encourage people to download malware, which is not good. So spoofing is basically a technique used to trick recipients into thinking an email comes from a legitimate source. Um, so that basically increases the likelihood that someone is going to do something uh, insecure. You know, provide some credentials, download a file, something like that. Uh, and due to the naive design of email, uh, <laughs> spoofing works. Uh, so, you know, you can prevent spoofing by having appropriate validation in place. So phishing, fraudulent email, um, you know, it basically attempts to be like, okay, this is from the bank. Please log in and update your credentials or your bank account's gonna be frozen. Send you to a different uh, website where you provide your credentials to folks who can now do bad things for you. Malware, probably know what that is. It's uh, you know, software that you download to uh, cause insecure or damaging behavior. So it could be you know, ransomware on your machine, it could be key logging, it could be any number of things. Uh, so how does that work? So basically we have our legitimate email chain with a legitimate email client and a legitimate sending service that then can send mail. And then we have our illegitimate chain which says, hey, I've sent this email and it's from this legitimate service. And then in our naive world, it comes in and it just Oh wow, I got another thing. No one looks at the email headers when they receive them in their client. And uh, then we have you know, good messages and bad messages mixed together. So we've got a, a few different things to, like there's sort of, uh, there's spam filtering in place. So uh, there are a few different things that can happen to kind of prevent uh, messages from ending up in spam or not delivered at all. Uh, you've got, uh, or ways, ways things can happen in spam, right? Security validation failures, um, delivery policy settings, uh, spammy content, the volume of email sent and sender reputation. So security validation failures, there are two primary security protocols. There's SPF and DKIM. Um, of note, not every sending service can support either, like both of these. Most will support one or the other. Um, so if a message fails validation, a receiving server might deliver it to a recipient's spam folder or not at all. So SPF uh, has been around since 2003. Basically, it allows you to whitelist specific sending IPs in your DNS, right? Um, so you can only have one SPF record, but you can have as many IPs as you need. Um, but if you're using like a bulk email service like Constant Contact or MailChimp, they have you know hundreds of IPs they're sending from, you're not gonna be able to actually whitelist all of those via SPF. So instead, for situations like that, you've got DKIM, which is Domain Key Identification Mail, Identified Mail, uh, been around since 2011. Basically, you generate a public-private pair. Uh, your public key gets posted as a text record in DNS, and then you add the private key to the services. And what that does is it encrypts the mail and makes sure that things aren't altered in transit, but it also serves as an indication that this is authorized for this domain because it's in your DNS. So the other kind of piece that ties this together is DMARC, uh, Domain-Based Message Authentication Reporting and Conformance, uh, which is a reporting framework. Um, and this is actually, um, it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around it, but once you get your head wrapped around it, it's actually super helpful. So basically, DMARC as a standard fails validation when a message fails both SPF and DKIM. So if it passes either SPF or DKIM, it will pass DMARC validation. And organizations can set what their DMARC policy is, which is you're telling recipients what to do 
when your message fail, when a message purportedly from you fails DMARC, so it fails both SPF and DKIM. So, you know, we'll talk about this in a little bit of detail, but you really don't want this to, uh, don't go crazy with the DMARC to start with because there are ways you could mess yourself up. So basically, DMARC supports three types of policies. The first one is none. What that says is, just let me know whether a message passes or fails DMARC. You know, take no other action. Let me know, meaning I'm sending you a message. Yeah, you said you, DMARC policy. Yeah, and you issue, uh, both of those things fail on your end. You're going to let me know exactly. that, that I, I failed both of those. Yes, and I'll let you know pass or fail, right? So basically, you're saying, tell me, tell like the sending organization, tell me anything that, any messages that purport to be from my organization, from my domain, tell me if they pass, if they fail. For every message. For every message. Right. Could be a lot of messages. Right. Um, so none says take no other action. Quarantine says if a message fails DMARC authentication, deliver it to the recipient spam folder. And reject says if it fails DMARC authentication, don't deliver it all, not even to the spam folder, just drop it on the floor. But let me know. Um, and DMARC supports applying uh, each of these standards to a percentage of your of the failures. Wait, so, wait, can you go back for a yeah. second? What does the first one do? Uh, so it's just reporting. Does not take any action about the deliverability of the message. So what happens to the message? It's delivered. It is delivered. Yeah. It, even it fails. Yeah. On both. But it's still delivered. Yeah, well, we'll talk about kind of how that fits in. It, it's, it's actually, there's a sort of a hidden feature of DMARC that's really useful. Uh, so basically, just to kind of get it, so we have DMARC policy. If, it, if it's a policy, of, if, if we have a failure, the DMARC policy is checked. If it is none, it's delivered. If it is reject, that failed message is dropped on the floor. If it's quarantine, it is... Um, put in the spam folder. In all cases, a report of the disposition of the message is sent back to the, the server that's, or the, the organization that is, um, you know, controls the DNS and has set up the DMARC record. So they're basically, failures can be of two types. One is failures of legitimate email. Right? So that's a, uh, a service that does not have either SPF or DKIM configured for that sending service. So if you fix those failures, you're improving your own legitimate email deliverability. The other is uh, spoofing attempts. Right? So if you, uh, so the DMARC is designed so that if someone is trying to spoof, they should not be able to spoof either SPF or DKIM, because you control all that in your DNS record, right? It's only whitelisted IPs or services where you put your private uh, DKIM key in, right? So those are both things in your control. So uh, uh, one category of failures that you'd like to fix, these are legitimate emails that fail for some reason. The other category of failures is these are people trying to impersonate you. So if we look at it in the whole context, email sent from a mail server on the recipient side, if it passes either SPF or DKIM, it's delivered. On, or, but if it fails both SPF and DKIM, hits the policy, and based on the policy, that's how it's disposed of. Either delivered if it's a policy of none, dropped on the floor if it's a policy of reject, delivered to spam if it's a policy of quarantine, and in all cases, you get that report back for what uh, what the disposition was. Does that all kind of make some sense? Yeah, I have a question on, like, if something passes, if it's sent from a legitimate server, mm -hmm. why does it still end up in spam? Because a lot of people are marking that. that sure, sure. Spam. Yeah, so that is, that is, like, so DMARC is just a place where you can say, in the case of a validation failure, this is what I want you, the receiving service, to do. 
Right. That is not saying that's the only reason it might end up in spam. I got it. Uh, so there are other reasons. Okay. Uh, go through, uh, conveniently, this slide will go For through. example. For example. Um, so anytime a recipient marks one of your messages as spam, yeah. um, that can hurt your uh, deliverability on that service. So you really don't want people marking your, um, your messages as spam on Gmail, for example, because you know, it's going to assume any message from your organization, any message that's very similar to this one from your organization may also be spam. Don't, uh, so a lot of this actually comes down to kind of uh, respecting your audience and what you actually send them, and maybe don't send them. Uh, so you don't want to mix different types of content in the same message, right? Think about messages that you receive that you would perhaps say, man, why am I getting this nonsense, right? You don't want to mix content. You want to have like, okay, this is an advertising email. This is a transactional email where I'm, you know, completing a membership or something that someone has signed up for. Um, you want to kind of, from a user behavior perspective, send the same channels of messages from the same email addresses. So don't have like, you know, message from the CEO that's also this advertisement, that's also, you know, the membership emails, transactional stuff, right? You want to have a separate email address for each of your channels of communication. Uh, don't use misleading subject lines. It's a great way to get someone to label your message spam. Uh, try to use spammy words or phrases. That changes year to year, but you can Google spammy email words. That's stuff that uh, spam filters on the receiving side will uh, pick up on. Um, don't use too many images. Uh, and this is a place where you'll kind of You'll, there's some tension here between um, sort of what marketers think is useful and what uh, email spam filters think is appropriate. Uh, so from an email spam filter perspective, you want at least 60% text, 40% images. Um, and don't include too many links. Uh, too many links in the, in the text, right? Uh, under five, two to three is kind of the best. And don't send attachments if you don't have to, right? All of that stuff, each of these things are, are things that if, the more you can hew to these best practices, the, the more you reduce the chance of ending up in spam in your recipient's email folders. Uh, other things, email volume, uh, email, uh, receiving email services. Um, look for Look for odd patterns and stuff. So if, uh, if suddenly you start sending a whole lot of email that you have not been sending a lot of email, that's going to look more spammy. Uh, they also, you know, um, so if you need to increase the amount of email you're sending out, you want to kind of build up over time. More um, enough. Yeah, basically. Um, and you you also want to send out email as a, in as consistent array as possible, so not to send things in bursts. So if, for example, uh, you'll see this in a lot of bulk email services, they'll say, about how much time do you want to spread these emails out over, right? You know, actually use probably the recommended spread. Don't kind of say, send them all at once. Um, and then if you've got, say, your own site that's going to send a large amount of email, you know, maybe that's not the best choice to do that. But if you're doing that, uh, try to spread it out. Uh, and then kind of the last piece is, um, there is sort of uh, send a reputation. So email services, like bulk email services, one of the things that they bring to the table is they actually try to keep uh, a good reputation for all their sending IPs. And uh, what they will do is if you as a customer start sending out a lot of spam, they'll drop you and they'll drop that IP and then they'll, you know, you know spin up a new IP to maintain their sending reputation because that's part of what they're selling as a bulk email service. Um, if you're doing your own email, you've got to be mindful of does your IP end up on any email black blacklists. Um, and then some sort of good citizen processes. So don't automatically opt in anyone 
to your bulk email, right? Avoid places where people could end up signed up unintentionally. Because again, like it, it's a whole user behavior thing. If on the receiving side, people are asking themselves the question, why do I have this email? They're much more likely to say this email is spam. Even though they did in fact fill out a contact form that did in fact have a checkbox that said, yes, please send me your advertisements, right? If that is not a checkbox that they, you know, consciously checked, they're very likely to treat your email as spam. Now they might still anyway, but you know, it's just, don't make it more likely for people to think you're spam. Um, so as a kind of follow up, don't purchase email addresses from other companies. Like that's a great way to just have your, your domain and your IP that's sending this stuff get marked as spam, right? Because people are like, why do I get this email? Um, and uh, you know, as you have people unsubscribe, honor that. As you have um, like bounces, keep your email list clean. And uh, always include that unsubscribe list in your email. So like the, the big kind of thing to remember is since there's a lot of stuff outside of your control, don't engage in practices that could lead to people thinking that your email is being spammy, right? That's spam, because that's a great way to decrease your deliverability. So what can you do and how should you do it? Basically, you're going to start by doing a quick check of your domain, then set up DMARC, and then review DMARC, make changes, and repeat that process over and over and over again. This is not something you're going to do in a week. Uh, to get to maybe where you want to be, this will probably be a few months. What, what are you reviewing? What are you changing? What are you reviewing? I'll, I'll go through it. Okay. okay. Um, and you basically generally want to increase your DMARC policy over time until you reach 100%. And then once you're there, you want to then monitor for new issues. So to start with, you can do a quick check of your domain. And this is just going to give you a high-level view of, here are some issues. Um, and if folks want to take a picture of these, I'm feel free. Bring that right. So this is an example of, um, of MX Toolbox. It's basically, it says, here are a bunch of tests. It checks your DMARC status your DKIM status, your SPS status, checks uh, if your domain is associated with any uh, blacklisted IPs, gives you a whole host of things. It's a good starting point. Um, I would do that as sort of a get the lay of the land. And then the next thing you want to do is you actually want to set up an appropriate DMARC policy and um, DMARC monitoring. So Easy DMARC and Power DMARC are two services that allow you to do this. Uh, they will create the DMARC record that you need to put in your DNS, and they will provide a um, recipient uh, location for all those messages so that you can then process those messages and actually make some sense about what's happening. Right? So you start with a DMARC policy of none, because right? we just want to get information to begin with. And then you configure your DMARC monitoring system and then run the monitoring for at least a week to get a reasonable cross-section of your email. And you'll get something that looks like this, right? And this is going to tell you all of the different sending services that purport to send from your domain, right? And then you'll start to see really like, hey, what is sending email in my organization's name, right? And um, it will tell you what passes. It'll tell you anything that fails one but passes the other, so it still passes DMARC. It'll tell you anything that fails. It'll let you know if there's something that looks suspicious. It also mentions for, uh, also I think it'll cover forwarding too. So typically uh, what will happen is when you look at this, you'll say, oh man, um, you know, like, you know, usually like, okay, MailChimp, that looks good. And we maybe we use Office 365 for email in our organization, right? That looks good. But hey, we got a bunch of email that's being sent via Gmail. 
no one here should be using that, right? Or you might see like, oh man, our Drupal site is failing D DMARC because we never set up DKIM or SPF for it, right? So you'll start to see here are all the different email vectors that you're sending email by and you also anything that looks weird. Um, so basically you'll be able to identify your legitimate services and then you'll kind of make some changes, right? So you want to make sure like, oh man, we, we forgot to configure either SPF or DKIM for this service. Well, fix that, right? Um, or um, you, know, you might say, oh man, the IP address that we're sending email from uh, for this service, like our CRM or something, that's on a blacklist. Okay, well then that's a thing that you'll need to address. Uh, you might need to you know, set up that website to send from a different service or something like that. There are options there. I'm not, gonna, I'm not the person to tell you what those are. But basically, you want to make changes. And then, after you've made the changes, you repeat the process and check it after another week. And see if new things pop up, see if things improve, until you, you're confident that you have um, a policy of none everything is being uh, delivered as you're expected, right? Then you want to slowly increase your policy, right? So you, then you want to say, okay, we're going to move to quarantine, but not all at once. Start with 5% is a general recommendation. If you say a huge amount of email, start with a lower percentage. But 5% is pretty good. And then once you've got that in place, let it run for a week and then slowly increase it week by week, addressing issues as you find them, until you get to 100% quarantine. And again, that's percentage of failure, yeah. What do you consider a huge amount of email? Um, I, would, I would Google that. Uh, that's, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, you know, probably if you're that bulk sender level, you definitely. 5,000 Yeah, numbers. yeah. Um, but basically, uh, you want to work up to quarantine, and then once you're at 100% quarantine, start at 5% reject and work your way up. Um, the reason you don't want to just go straight to 100% reject is you're telling the recipient email services, hey, if it fails SPF or DCAM, and DCAM, don't deliver it at all. Right? And so you need to be judicious about this and conservative to make sure that your, your messages are being delivered because you're going to have people who have like weird configurations. So for example, when I was putting this talk together, um, you know, we set up DMARC for, for our domain and I use Gmail as sort of my clearinghouse for, uh, for email, but we use Rackspace as the company email. I would not bothered to set up uh, actually sending uh, my work email through Rackspace's SM SMTP system. So that was failing, you know, correctly failing DMARC. So that was a thing that we were able to notice and fix immediately, right? Because there's going to be, it's not always going to be a technology situation. It could be, you know, some rogue account manager doing a crazy thing over there on, and, and just hasn't set up his laptop correctly. Uh, but basically, you want to go through this whole process, and then once you've got to 100%, keep the DMARC monitoring going, right? You check it once a month, uh, because you're going to find out, oh, we brought on this new person. They set their laptop wrong. Oh, we migrated our website to a new server. The IP address changed. We didn't change the SPF record. Oh, we forgot we, they're using a new service for mass, mass email. We didn't set up DKIM on that. Um, or, hey, there's malicious activity, let's send out an email to folks to say, look, if you get something that purports to be from us, that's not us, right? So the monitoring not only allows you to get control of your own deliverability, it also allows you to protect reputation of the domain. So kind of in summary, five, uh, top five ways to mess up your email deliverability. Uh, First off, send unwanted emails or send mail to previously unsubscribed addresses. Uh, don't authenticate your sending domain with either SPF or DKIM. Um, mess with uh, 
the correct format, right? That's, that's a great way. Um, don't align the domain sender from in the header with either SPF, uh, with either the SPF domain or DKIM domain. Uh, so a place that that's actually bit us a fair amount is you can, you can mess that up in web form, right? Just by having like, so let's say, let's say this, this is a common thing, right? So um, during development, you've got an internal, um, an internal company address or something that is used for this website. Then you deploy it to the client and the, that address doesn't get changed to the client's domain, right? So that's a place where, hey, now we are creating that mismatch, so that's gonna fail. Uh, last one, uh, avoid email blacklists. Uh, so that's just a monitoring thing. So the kind of key takeaways uh, is if you rush into this, particularly with DMARC, you can mess things up. So take your time, follow the process. Uh, and really think about it as a process in two parts. So anytime you make changes, you need to update your validation and uh, you need to monitor deliverability uh, in case new issues pop up. So that's, that's it, questions? How do you monitor deliverability? Uh, DMARC, right? So that's going to give you information about um, the disposition of emails that you send. Yeah. You can also get some stuff uh, if you're using a mass email service. Um, they'll talk about open rate, um, bounces, and stuff like that. Um, but that's only on a per service basis. Uh, and that's, that's really based off of whether they're having uh, the emails bounce back to them or, you know, they're seeing an open or click through uh, based on, hey, we have a tracking pixel in this image, so we know it got open to a client somewhere. I've heard that it's not good to include tracking pixels and things like that for deliverability. I mean, anything, any, it could, it could. I mean, there's no... There's no silver bullet because different, different spam filters have different opinions about what things are important. And it's typically a spam score situation. Um, so you can, uh, I pulled the slide out, uh, but uh, there are um, services that you can like run, like deliver an email to, and it will give you a spam score on that based off of you know, the content of the email as well as the domain configuration as well as the ascending IP. Um, but again, it's, the best you can do is kind of tilt the odds in your favor, right? There's still gonna be stuff outside of your control. Um, and, you know, the, the, the monitoring will help you at least get a picture and take some action. What do you do if you get blacklisted? What do you, you get out of uh, So it depends a little bit on uh, what has gotten blacklisted. Um, so uh, if your email sending service has gotten blacklisted, some of their IPs are blacklisted, then you complain. And if they don't fix that, then you move to a different email sending service. Um, if it's your IP, because um, it's your server, you know, probably the easiest thing is to get a different IP. <laughs> um, I believe there are ways you can try to get off the blacklist, but that probably indicates that there is, that server may have some issues, right? Because it ended up there because it's been reported that a lot of spam has been sent by that server. So if you drop an IP that's blacklisted, is it, is it always blacklisted? Or is it, like, is it blacklisted for six weeks? Or? So I think that depends on the, uh, on the blacklist, because uh, there are different blacklist monitoring services. And I don't know the average. Like, you know, if I, get a, if I spin up a server on DigitalOcean, LightSail, wherever, Leno, and I get an IP address, how do I know it's not, it, it wasn't blacklisted before? You can check the blacklist. Yeah. Like MX Tools, they, send, yeah. they give you an option for the 
to see what ideas on like what's going on. I see. And 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 honestly, uh, we've had some some issues with depending on the host. Some of them do a much better job of policing their IPs than others. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So some of them don't care that much, and so those are ones you probably. If you're going to use that host, you probably don't want to uh, send email from servers on that host. What? Well, it would melt you. They'll, they'll shut your account down. Yeah. If you, if you have like a email list and you send a bunch of uh, get a bunch of spam or bounces off of it. Yeah, because like deliverability is part of what they're selling. Yeah. So you got to be careful if you're managing you know, like campaign mailing for people. That you, you have to break up your account so that you don't have somebody that's risky with you know like a client that's going to be very stable. Mm -hmm. The way yeah. I have an account shut down, we used to send about 700,000 emails a month for hospitals, and we got one bad list, and they stopped us everywhere, stopped us in the wow. water until we went in and explained what happened. It was just a, somebody sent us a list that they didn't verify. So I've seen I've seen services like this that say, oh, we verify email addresses and things like that, and, and email checking services. That you give it a list of emails and then they'll check to see if these are good emails or like these are bad emails. Mm -hmm. what's, what's that about? Well, I mean, that's just saying like, hey, this is actually not going to bounce. But that's no no. Uh, but still, if you send emails to that list, you're basically still risking them, the actual people on the other side saying, why did I get this email? They didn't opt in. Yeah, they didn't opt in. So they're very likely to say, this is spam. And then your spam score is likely to go through the roof because your email for your domain is getting uh, associated with email that's marked spam. I mean, the, like, it can be frustrating, but the, the right answer is, only send email to people who have actually asked you to send email to them that you have a relationship or you have a relationship with, right? right. And then one of the one of the things we do is like we'll, we'll set up applications and for for customers and then we run it, manage it for them. And the reason I'm here is that we we didn't. We didn't do it for them, but I was looking into it. I don't know if you know about this, like it's called Nylas or something, or, or MailSpring. Okay, not familiar. And what you do is, it's like a campaign manager. Mm -hmm. right? You're sending out thousands of emails. But what you do is you, you get like different Gmail addresses or 365 addresses or different domain addresses and you tie it to them and it just does like a round robin mm -hmm. off of that. I think it's like a spamming software or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, I mean, that seems like uh, pretty risky. Yeah. Um, I think that it would be, uh, you know, may well violate uh, like Gmail's terms of service specifically. Yeah. Um, so I would expect uh, <laughs> that to cause problems eventually. Yeah. Yeah, because like, you know, I mean, most like most stuff around spam and most stuff around like SEO, for example, it's all folks trying to game the system, and then safeguards being put in place to prevent the gaming of the system, right? So if you're like, okay, we found this technological solution to what is you know essentially a marketing problem, it's going to get shut down eventually. <coughs> Which is not what, you know, organizations want to hear. <laughs> we want you to put the, do the magical, get us the list and send it out and, you know, avoid the spam. It's, it's a, you know, it's a people thing more than a technology thing. I, I, think, I, think that, I think DMARC's really nice because it actually gives you information and it allows you to take control of stuff, but it, does, it is a process. Uh, it's not a just set it and forget it. Does um, like Gmail offer some sort of report? So Gmail offers uh, a uh, postmaster report uh, where they will tell you what percentage of uh, email from your domain uh, 
is marked as spam. Um, the, uh, you need a certain threshold for that report to be populated. Um, I don't know what that is. I know that we did not send out enough email from our domain that that report is populated. Yeah, I'm asking about 75,000 more right now. Yeah, yeah so it, uh, if you Google um, a Gmail Postmaster report, it'll, it'll be there. Uh, you might need to have a, like a verified domain or something. Oh, okay. But yeah, but that, that, that will tell you. And that's where that 0.1%, that, um, 0.3% numbers are. For need to stay below that 0.3 percent and a yeah, hundred. Yeah. Curious what was over, over history of. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I see it in Mailchimp, right? I see the deliverability and opens and stuff like that. But. Yeah, uh, the, the postmaster report is. I, I think it's pretty important these days, um, just given uh, you know where uh, where Gmail's going with this. So it is now 4:46. So. Uh, any last question? Final call? All right. Well, thanks, y'all.